Welcome to today's webinar, What's Up with the Work World Dealing with Difficult Coworkers and Constituents webinar, brought to you by NCSL. All lines have been placed on listen-only mode to provide favorable sound quality during today's presentation. It is now my pleasure to turn the floor to Jean Rose. Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, sponsored by the National Conference of State Legislatures, the Legislative Staff Coordinating Committee, and by the NCSL's Young Professionals Group. My name is Gene Rose, formerly of NCSL, and now with the strategic communications firm of Marmillion and Company. This is the 11th webinar that is part of the NCSL University Series. We hope you will join us as we explore other issues and provide professional development opportunities throughout the year. Previous sessions on social media trends, social media policy issues, child abuse reporting laws, an April report on the fiscal health of states, the 225th anniversary of the U.S. Constitution, media relations, the Mississippi River, and the state legislative elections are all archived and available on the NCSL website. Those sessions are free for state legislators and legislative staff. Our format today for What's Up with the Work World, Dealing with Difficult Coworkers and Constituents, is that our speakers will present for about the next 40 minutes or so, and then we'll open up the floor to your questions. As stated previously, you can submit a question at any time in the chat box located in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. Today our subject concerns dealing with generational differences and personalities, understanding changing expectations from boss to boss, and learning how to deal with stressful situations. We'll learn how to get along with difficult people in the workplace with professionalism and respect. Our speakers will guide us through many of the common but irritating situations, offering useful insight to young professionals for all kinds of offices. Our speakers today are Bruce Foistel, who is a senior fellow at the National Conference of State Legislatures, where he provides training and educational programs for legislators and legislative staff, and participates in management studies of legislatures. He's a former attorney for the Wisconsin Legislature and has an incredible amount of international experience organizing and teaching at seminars on bill drafting, the legislative process, and conducting parliamentary needs assessments. Lori Christopher has been employed in the management of human resources for more than 30 years, having worked in both the private and public sectors. She's currently the human resources director for the Oregon Legislative Branch and has served in that capacity for the past 15 years. Her private sector experience includes work with a national 350,000 employee organization and a small local human resources company working with over 200 private employers. Lori is also serving in her sixth term as mayor of Kaiser, Oregon. With that, I gladly turn the program over to Bruce Foistel. Bruce? Thank you, Gino. We'll start with a little inspiration from Mother Teresa. The idea that some people come into your life as blessings, some come into your life as lessons. Imagine you're a legislative aide. It's getting dark at night. It's one of those few nights when you get a chance to have some personal time and you're looking forward to it. Everyone else in your office has checked out for the evening and you're alone, but the clock is ticking and you're just about out the door. And then one last ring of the telephone, you pick it up, and it's a constituent and someone whose voice you've heard before. You realize you're in for a long session. It's someone who doesn't get to the point, always has problems, and you realize you're going to be stuck for a few minutes. What's important in all this? I think part of what we're dealing today is what's the perspective that you have to take. I don't mean to tell you that dealing with those kind of tough uh, constituents or your colleagues or your bosses is easy, but part of what I want to stress today is that especially as young, pr uh, um, young professionals, these kind of behaviors and dealing with these kind of people is a way to climb the ladder, is a way to show your stuff, show your valuable to the legislative workforce. It's an important skill and something to be developed. It may not be the first thing that you think of, but that ability to deal with difficult behaviors, difficult situations is part of what allows young professionals to increase their uh, worth in the legislative arena 
uh, be particularly useful uh, to their bosses uh, and to their colleagues. So what we'll talk about today is what's important in all this. What are the difficult behaviors that you and your colleagues have identified? We'll talk about some general considerations, but then some specific strategies for common problems and final tips. That'll comprise my portion of the descriptions today. And then Lori, uh, Christopher from Oregon, will talk about involving HR, when you should bring them in, how you should bring them in, uh, and common uh, strategies uh, for working with your HR uh, directors and officers. So what's important in all this? Well, dealing with difficult coworkers and constituents is just part of the job. It may come up in a context when you're least expecting it. It may come up uh, un unseen to you, but you know what's coming. In any kind of legislative position, both in my time in Wisconsin uh, working as a legislative attorney and watching others there uh, for each of us, nonpartisan staff, partisan staff, or NCSL workers, uh, it is just part of the job. And it is a skill, this dealing with the difficult coworkers and constituents. It's something that you can consciously improve. You can reflect on, uh, seek out others, uh, strategically improve your ability to handle those situations. In all those situations, no matter what's in front of you, you're the one who has the chance to control your own attitude and action. It may feel like things are pulling away from you, that you're, you're not in control, but your own attitude and your own actions are something uh, that you do control. It's interesting, I'm looking across at Stacy Householder here at NCSL, who's a young professional who has an ability to deal with difficult situations and gets more focused and connected to her own job and getting things done, the harder things become. And that's essentially what you're trying to do. You're trying to focus on getting your job done uh, in those tough situations, uh, handling things as best you can, and buying yourself time to uh, deal with the situation in more depth at a later uh, time down the road. So you're improving all this by planning, by practice and reflection. But what I want to do is start all of us thinking of the best models that we've ever seen because the best models we've ever seen give us insight into what we're trying to capture uh, and what we're doing. And I'm going back to my days as a young professional, which are well over 30 years ago, to two situations in the Wisconsin legislature. The first one involves a lobbyist, and not many people traditionally think of lobbyists as being important uh, to the institution and, and being a key fabric, uh, part of the fabric in, in the legislature. But when I was starting uh, in the 1970s, uh, Milwaukee County had a lobbyist by the name of George Rice. He was one of the most thoughtful and graceful and kind individuals, uh, but he always seemed in control. And what comes back to me over 30 some years later was a situation in, le in a legislative hearing where the then speaker of the house in the Wisconsin legislature just tore into George Rice who was testifying on behalf of a bill. It was obvious there was some bad blood going on uh, between the speaker and, and the lobbyist, uh, George. Uh, but these sort of things didn't usually come out in the legislative arena. But for some reason, the speaker, who while being very talented and, and very politically savvy, also had a mean streak, also had the uh, intimidating factor, and he went after George. He started pushing him, asking embarrassing questions, going outside the bounds uh, that uh, all of us who were in the uh, meeting felt was what was appropriate. But to his credit, George never rose to the bait. He answered the questions that were behind the attacks and gave information and acted as if nothing was amiss. The speaker kept goading him, trying to get a reaction, and George just continued to play his role as a well 
well-prepared lobbyist and kept speaking to the, uh, the bill that was at issue and describing uh, his viewpoint and answering uh, the underlying concerns that the speaker was, was mentioning. In, in all of it, he never broke a sweat. He never uh, changed demeanor, uh, acted as if everything was normal, uh, and never gave any kind of indication uh, that uh, he was feeling the stress that was going on. The other situation actually involved someone who had mental health problems. There, there was a, a constituent in those days uh, of Wisconsin named Lloyd Swanson. He was a former state official and a very bright individual, uh, but was someone who was unbalanced, might be uh, diagnosed today as being bipolar or, or something along those lines, uh, but he could uh, go from being interacting normally to all of a, shout, a sudden shouting and, and being very argumentative, uh, uh, very uh, attacking of whoever was in his line of vision. Uh, and Senator Fred Risser, who is still around, had an aide uh, named Leslie Travis, a very uh, thoughtful young woman who had the ability to uh, work with Lloyd uh, and calm him down. And she happened to be in this public setting when Lloyd uh, became unhinged. And she just walked up to him very confidently and said, Lloyd, I have some information back in Fred's office uh, that I think you need to see. It's going to be helpful for us to get your feedback. But she treated him with kindness, treated him with respect, and helped pull him out of the situation. Uh, but in each step of the way, she was the picture of calm, control, while the rest of us who were in this room were sort of standing around trying to figure out what to do. Leslie moved in, uh, used her you know, talents, but also her skills at connecting with him personally, uh, treating him with respect, but getting him out of that situation and back to their own office. Well, in all of these models for me, and hopefully all of the models for yourselves, there are certain attributes that are coming up. In some of this, it's the calm demeanor. Uh, it's the patience that each of them showed in those situations. It's the focus on continuously doing your job and focusing on that. In some ways, it's the objectivity, uh, being non-judgmental. Uh, it's also an aspect of not taking things personally. Not so much in these particular situations, but other key attributes are also the courage to stick up for yourself and being assertive, finding that proper level between uh, assertiveness and acquiescence uh, in connecting with others. But what we'd like to do now is give you all a chance to vote on what you think is the most important attribute in these situations. So Stacy's going to allow you to cast your votes. It'll take just a few more seconds for you to do that. So we're ending the poll and we're sharing the results with you uh, on that. Uh, by far and away, the calm demeanor is what you have suggested is important, uh, uh, patience. Uh, which are often tied together. So those two uh, together are uh, being indicated uh, as almost two-thirds of you uh, identifying that's sort of the top of the line uh, of importance uh, in dealing with these kinds of situations and these kind of people. Well, difficult behaviors. What, what particularly uh, causes the young professional uh, particular angst in, in dealing with uh, uh, co-workers and constituents. 
I did get the chance to interview uh, some legislative staff from around the, uh, the country, also some of the young professionals here at NCSL, uh, and uh, my two own young professional daughters, uh, in, and they are very similar kinds of, of work uh, going forward. Uh, and here's what you all had to say. What's particularly troubling for you or challenging are negative attitudes, people who no matter what subject you bring up, always bring out the problems with things, uh, the can't be done uh, attitude. Also the bullies, the intimidators, the people like the speaker in the situation I described who uh, try to get what they want uh, by in intimidating others uh, into going along with them. Uh, gossiping, uh, trying to find a way to handle uh, those kinds of folks, and also particularly in dealing with bosses, the micromanagers, uh, the micro, the young professional trying to show her, his or her worth but feeling constantly overmanaged uh, by a boss, uh, you know, having to check in with every step of the way, uh, not getting the creativity or flexibility uh, to handle some of those key uh, duties. Another key irritant uh, for your, uh, your group was non-responsiveness. Uh, connecting with people who you may be part of a team with uh, on something you definitely have to do and having the feel, feeling that your emails are going out into cyberspace and no amount of, of uh, re-emailing or uh, phone calls or other attempts to uh, connect uh, seem to do the trick with these people. Also the untrustworthy people, the stab you in your back, you know, stab you in the back types. Uh, those who seem out to get you. Uh, not that this happens often, but when it does, uh, it, per it gives you a particular uh, challenge on how to go. And then personality differences, just the kind of different people having different expectations, uh, different uh, ways of approaching uh, their work and their thinking. Also mentioned by you are just the angry folks, people who are out of control with their anger, much like uh, the unbalanced uh, uh, constituent, uh, but situations in which people's emotions, particularly anger, uh, just overwhelms them and uh, it makes things hard to, uh, to deal with. The chronic complainer, very much like the negative attitude uh, person, uh, just threatens to pull you into uh, unproductive time. The long-winded uh, people, people who fail to get to the point. Sometimes, especially if you're an aide uh, to a legislator, uh, the political opponent uh, can just wear you out, uh, not uh, getting the sense of, of finding the ability to find uh, common ground. Also mentioned by a number of uh, young professionals is just disrespectful. It may be harder at the earlier stages of your career to get that respect, that you feel like you may have to go above and beyond uh, normal uh, achievements to get just a, a modicum of respect uh, from uh, legislators or, or others. And, and also dealing with constituents who won't accept your legislator's solution or decision, won't go on to look for the next step, but want to constantly uh, bring this back up. Uh, and that can connect to unrealistic expectations, particularly with constituents. Uh, just that thought of the idea that you or your legislator uh, can move heaven and earth uh, to solve their problems. Uh, so, first off, what's your most difficult coworker? Stacy will bring up the poll question and let's vote on those kinds of issues, whether it's uh, the options you're getting here are the uh, negative attitude, the bully, uh, the gossip, the micromanager, the non-responsive, or the untrustworthy. So we'll give you about 30 more seconds to vote.
Maybe we'll put a fork in it and see what our results are. The negative attitude seems to, to carry the day uh, and the untrustworthiness uh, second, uh, but a fair amount uh, among the other behaviors, and, and some of these can be uh, very much interrelated. Uh, but uh, we'll uh, note that going uh, forward uh, uh, as we go. Through. So in all of these, there, there's first of all some overlapping uh, considerations for all these, where there's negativity, the bullying, the intimidating. Uh, we'll go for some general considerations, uh, and, and then we'll talk about some specific strategies for uh, various aspects. But first of all is the idea of staying in the moment. Uh, the difficulty may come as a surprise. It may uh, come up totally out of left field. I talked with one uh, person here at NCSL who related uh, her most difficult uh, challenge and it was completely out of an innocuous situation, seemed to be almost uh, conversational, uh, hardly meaning anything at all, and all of a sudden uh, she came under attack. Uh, but it's at that moment where that calm demeanor, patience piece is absolutely your first line of defense. You have to turn a switch in your own mind and say, I've got a difficult moment. I'm going to remember all those things that I'm trying to uh, to follow here. Uh, but it comes first as that recognition. And part of what I did here at NCSL in coming up with these considerations was talk to some of the people who do this best. Uh, and Arturo, Arturo Perez here at NCSL is probably our star uh, on uh, connecting with difficult people in difficult situations. He embodies the patience. Uh, he embodies the calm demeanor. And what Arturo says is he creates this image, of an, uh, image in his own mind of the North Star. He's pointing long distance. He's thinking big picture. And he thinks to himself when it, these situations arise, what's important here? What do I have to do that's important? and gets me past the distractions of dealing with somebody who is either being mean, being angry, uh, being unreasonable. And he keeps that focus throughout the conversation. He may even write it down on a piece of paper to constantly connect him back to the idea uh, that he's got to think of the important strategy here, uh, what's important for this person in answering the information request, but what's important here uh, in being a good uh, customer servant uh, to this constituent, even if uh, they aren't being the nicest person in the real uh, in the world right now? What it does is it emphasizes engaged listening. You turn on your listening skills. You increase uh, the ability uh, to, to hear. Uh, beyond the surface of what the person is saying and try and get at what's driving uh, the person's uh, behavior and question. Uh, you try to be as calm as you can and you think of those professional models. For me, it's the lobbyist or the aide who did so well, but I try to keep those models in mind uh, as I'm going forward. But as you're dealing with this, one of the things that's going through your, your, uh, your thought process is can I handle this by myself? What am I going to have to handle on my own and what should I take to those above me uh, in the chain of command uh, but also in the human resources uh, field? And this is exactly what Lori is going to be talking about after I finish. But I put this, at, this slide in at this point for you to realize that if you're in a situation that involves some of these aspects of violence or threat of violence, uh, criminal violation, uh, already you've got to be thinking about uh, connecting this, uh, getting your side of the story straight in your own mind uh, for uh, connecting with HR.
But Lori will talk about that next. I just interject this at this point because it's got to be part of your overall plan on how do I deal with difficult people. So in your general considerations, you're handling this in the moment as best you can. You're often viewed by others around you, as George Rice was in that hearing, uh, for how you handle things in this situation. If there are other people involved, their eyes are on you. Their, their thought process is probably better you than me, uh, glad that they aren't the focus of the anger or the problem. Uh, but their eyes will be on you, uh, as well as the person who you're engaged with. Don't respond in emotion or anger. It may be an overwhelming thought, but it's, it's just a, a moment's pleasure uh, of responding back with a zinger, uh, uh, and uh, so much can go wrong if you start following down that, uh, uh, that line. Try to keep that calm demeanor. Try to assess what's going on. Try to listen and stay professional. Uh, uh, ask the clarifying questions that help you get to the bottom of things. But in all this, uh, keep to your basic job description, uh, skills, knowledges, abilities uh, to handle what's going on. Uh, in the separate portion of your mind, you reflect on what's, what you want out of this, what's going wrong. Uh, think about whether this is an ongoing problem or just something it's going to be a one-and-done uh, problem uh, with this person. You do it the best you can and, and move on. But in your mind, assess what's going on uh, and uh, keep that in your mind as you're dealing with the immediate situation. Think about whether it would help you to uh, talk to a trusted colleague, friend, or supervisor. One of the conflicting points that people had varying opinions on is you just deal with the person who's the problem or do you talk to others? And my honest uh, advice for you is you do get a better sense of things talking to a trusted colleague, someone who can give you perspective on what you've just been through, someone you can debrief with, someone who can help you on your next steps, go through that reflecting on what you want, what's wrong, figuring out where you go forward in all this. I do think it's important to stick up for yourself. I know as a legislative aide uh, and as a legislative staffer, you're often in that position where you, it's not about you, you're helping others, uh, but you have to make sure uh, that you do what you can uh, to make sure that you're treated with respect. So that's part of your uh, analysis going forward to make sure that you don't repeatedly get put in the same situation with people who are bullying you or intimidating you and going forward. And I think particularly helping, uh, it's helpful to talk with a trusted colleague, friend or supervisor uh, about how to stick up for yourself in a way that's proper within your own agency's guidelines, customs and traditions. But I'm very big on action. I think that you have to decide what needs to be done and then you have to go out and take the steps to, to do it to make sure that you're in the best position going forward. An honest consideration on all of this, and I speak <laughs> of myself uh, as well as anybody else, is saying, what's my role in all this? The, the bottom point is always realizing to someone else, you are the difficult coworker, you know, that if I'm thinking about this, I have to realize someone is, you know, if there's a problem here, someone's seeing me through their own lens as being the difficult coworker. So do some analysis, some honest analysis, and this is where talking to a trusted friend can help, uh, do an honest analysis of what's my role in all this, um, realizing through personality differences and I use the Myers-Briggs personality indicator uh, as an example, you can get a sense of, you know, am I much more structured than other people and this is going to cause friction with the flexible creative types? Uh, am I more of a thinker and uh, the people who are more emotionally based 
uh, and feeling decision makers going to reach different conclusions. So assess yourself in realizing if you're having a problem, is there some just basic personality differences that are going, uh, going awry here? Know your own hot buttons. We all have them. We all have things that push us. Um, it may be in those different situations, uh, things that uh, press us out of um, uh, context or uh, unreasonable reactions. Uh, we all have them, so it's knowing yourself, recognizing the stress, stress and objectively reviewing your own behavior in all of this. Sometimes in this, it, it requires having uh, a discussion with the difficult person. Uh, this difficult person may be your boss, it may be uh, a coworker, uh, so those power dynamics can uh, enter into it. Uh, but in all of this, I urge you to take a, a positive approach, try to find safe, neutral ground in time to have the discussion, uh, use I statements about uh, being clear about your own uh, feelings and reactions to things, but then truly follow the Stephen Coven uh, covenant of seeking first to understand. We often listen to others just waiting to give our own opinion, uh, and, and that's not what's going on here. You truly have to listen uh, to try to understand the other person's perspective, and it isn't uh, an easy process and may tell you some things about yourself that you're not particularly happy to hear. Uh, but listen non-judgmentally, ask open-ended questions, be clear and specific in your own uh, responses, and have suggestions about what may improve your own uh, relationships uh, in the future. But be open to the other's suggestions. Don't start out with it's got to be this or nothing. Uh, be open in these kinds of things and look at all this as ways of improving your skills and improving your work situation. Uh, finally, uh, find solution or find help. If the two of you meeting together uh, doesn't find a solution that will work uh, for you, uh, then uh, take it up the chain uh, to either your boss or to HR. Uh, some specific strategies for common problems. Uh, for the angry person, it's a particular emphasis on the, the calm and focus. Uh, it, it's so hard in those situations to not get swept up in the anger, uh, but listen to make sure you understand the person's viewpoint and also do that mental assessment. Is this just a general bully who's uh, gotten through life by intimidating others or is there genuine anger over a particular situation? Is this just some political uh, or other tactic? What's, what's going on? And it's a continuous re remembrance to stay professional. You can only control yourself, uh, so control what you can control and don't take things personally unless it's truly a personal attack. For the negative attitude, don't let it color your own positive approach. Do take the time to consider whether what the person's saying is legitimate criticism. Don't dismiss someone's, you know, what you think is a negative attitude uh, by just blithely uh, going over something that may indicate something that really could be improved. So take the time to ask for specific facts. Uh, get the pe person off of just a general negative attitude and, and get them connected to okay, let's solve the problem here, uh, tell me exactly what is going on, uh, and uh, let's work from there. But keep a workmanlike attitude uh, toward this. Uh, ask the person for ideas, but keep them in a responsible position. Don't let them just whine and say, ain't it awful, uh, but uh, get them thinking, um, okay, it's our responsibilities as legislative staff to make improvements, where do we go from here? Uh, and where you have the chance, you know, my personal sense is avoid whiners. Uh, you, you do get the sense that some people uh, are just continuous whiners. That's their way they go through life. Uh, it can bring you down. So if you have the 
the ability to choose teams and work with others uh, by choice in certain situations. Uh, do surround yourself with pos positive people. Uh, you can't change everyone. Uh, you could spend a lifetime trying to turn around a negative attitude and you might never make a dent in it. So keep yourself uh, on achievable goals. On the disrespectful, also stay professional. The advice here came uh, from a number of people that when your, your own information, your own uh, opinions were dismissed by others, that's when you turn yourself to evidence-based information. Find facts, find the opinions of others, uh, use people that this person might respect, uh, but if your own opinion is dismissed, show your skills at uh, gathering information from, from others uh, and opinions of, uh, of well-respected people. Um, you'll build to the point where your own uh, opinions will be valued, uh, but you have to bridge the gap. Uh, also, this is a cover-yourself kind of situation. Uh, you may put some of this... Uh, uh, connecting with this person uh, in email. Uh, you, you may have witnesses uh, for the, the kinds of interactions you have, uh, but it's important <coughs> to do some things uh, to be uh, put yourself in a situation uh, where it's not just your word against this person's. And also, similar to the negative attitude, you can't earn everyone's respect, so you try to stay professional. Couple more minutes here, and Laurie, I'll be turning it over to you. Okay. Uh, the micromanaging a boss or um, a micromanaging boss or a bossy person, uh, you first start with the, the, the idea of whether or not the person is your boss. Uh, you don't have to take the micromanaging from someone who isn't. Uh, so differentiate your response based on whether this is someone you have to uh, respond to or not but also build the case for more independence. Uh, articulate what you've done on a particular situation, how you've handled something. Make the case for getting increased independence and realize you may get it in some areas of your work and then prove yourself in those areas. And from there, you'll get expanded flexibility, creativity, and independence. For gossip, I think it's foolish to ignore the fact that legislatures are gossip havens. Uh, there's gossip running around legislatures all the time, everywhere. Uh, differentiate between the intel that you gather in some of those situations and unproductive uh, gossip. Uh, and, and then just essentially develop a strategy, develop a message, in a sense, to pull yourself out of those gossip conversations. Um, you know, I have other work to do now, I just have to uh, leave you, uh, leave you in this conversation, or, or whatever it may be. But actually, develop a strategy to deal with those situations. Uh, if the gossip focuses on you uh, and it's negative, clarify it with the people who need to know. You can't um, to know the truth. You can't please everyone. You can't convince everyone. Uh, but figure out who's important: your boss or your immediate colleagues who needs to know, uh, and then connect with them and, and don't worry about the uninformed, un, uh, uninvolved gossipers. Uh, but do protect confidential information. It's absolutely critical uh, in almost every legislative staff position. Realize what needs to remain confidential and, and keep it so. Uh, there's no easier way to lose your job in any legislative staff position uh, and any NCSL staff position, uh, then to take confidentiality, uh, to ignore key confidential information uh, and pass it on. Uh, it's, it's really easy to get pulled into conversations where those things come up, uh, but always think confidentiality first, and if in doubt, protect confidentiality or what you suppose to be uh, confidentiality. Final points of evidence, uh, emphasis for my piece, it's dealing with difficult people is a skill. 
You have to consciously develop it, find models who do it well and emulate them, seek guidance, then plan, reflect, and practice uh, to improve your skills and recognize when you hit these situations uh, and then use Arturo Perez's North Star Focus. Write down, I'm focusing on what's important and keep your whole line of thought on that. Stay calm and listen uh, and reflect with a mentor, uh, supervisor, or HR person uh, where it's appropriate. Uh, and with that in mind, Lori, being okay. the HR person, it's to you. Okay, thanks, Bruce. Well, the first thing I would tell you is uh, th uh, just to remind you that you get to control one person, and that person is you. You will not have control over the three significant um, behaviors that you identify, negative, people with negative attitudes, people who are untrustworthy, and bullies. You will not have control over those folks, yet they will continue to come and go throughout your career. So what I would give you is my best advice, my best human resource advice gathered over 30 years of practicing in various HR fields, and that would be four points. The first point would be don't mirror bad behavior. When someone confronts you with a negative attitude, don't mirror that behavior. Don't, don't say, well, yes, I understand that you, how you feel about that, and what about this? Because to meet that, that that brings you into their negativity, and other people are watching how you deal with these negative people. Other people are watching how you interact with untrustworthy people and bullies. Your career is going to be a long time. People will come and go. They're, they're transient, and they'll, they'll move in and out of your career, but your career is going to be for a long time. So people will, be, people will, will may not remember what you say, but they'll remember how you made them feel. So my advice would be don't mirror their behavior and think about the long term. It's going to be, like I said, your career is going to be a long career and this person is going to come and go and they're not going to dictate to you whether or not you're successful in your career long time. The next piece of advice would be, is it critical to win this confrontation? This specific confrontation that you're having with a negative person or an untrustworthy person or a bully, is it important for you to win at this scenario or is it more important to maintain the relationship? As I said, this person may come and go throughout your career and you want to make sure that as that happens, I can't tell you've maintained the relationship. I can't tell you how many times that people have had really negative interactions with a coworker only to find out five years later they're going to have to work for that person. That could very well happen, to, and, and legislatures are volatile places. So you certainly want to ensure that you can maintain the relationship on the long term. So three points. Don't mirror the behavior. Your career is going to last a long time. People are going to remember how you made them feel, not necessarily what you said. And the third point is, is it more critical to win the confrontation or maintain the relationship? Keep those things in mind while someone's beating you up. <laughs> and I mean with words. I certainly don't mean physically. So why involve HR ever? It's just one more person to get involved in an, al in an already unsavory situation that you're not happy that you're involved in. Well, obviously, if there's violence or if there's threats of violence, you want to involve human resource professional immediately. We want to protect you, and we want to protect your coworker, and we want to maintain a safe working environment. We have experience with that. All of us continue to get training in human resources and how to deal with these types of situations. You may not deal with it every day in your regular work life, but we do. That's our job. So violence or threats of violence, please come to human resources. And here's the things that are going to help us. So listen and take note of the, of the situation that you've been involved in. It doesn't help us for you to come to us and say, I just had an interaction with Joe Blow and he's a real jerk and he threatened me. What I'm going to need from you is specifics. I was here. Joe Blow came in and said this. He acted this way. This is how long the interaction lasted. Here's people who witnessed this environment. This is how I feel. This is what I want you to do. If you can give me some of those specifics, 
then I can begin to investigate and take the steps necessary to protect you and also to maintain a safe work environment. Um, documentation, uh, we'll, we'll bring a neutral party perspective. We're going to hear both sides. And if you come to me and say that you've had a threat uh, or um, someone has been violent towards you, I'm going to investigate that. So I'm going to talk to both parties and determine what the situation what happened in the situation and then make some recommendations. But first and foremost, I'm going to protect you if it was violence or threat. The second time you want to come the second issue that you'd want to come to us is a criminal act or an ethical act. If you witnessed something or were involved in something or were aware of something that is a criminal act or an ethical act, then that's above your head. You want to be out of that and you want to involve human resources sooner than later. Um, obviously, sexual harassment falls under the, the headline of violence or threats. If somebody is, is asking for sexual favors or making unwanted advances towards you, you'll want to get a third-party perspective. You'll want to involve a professional. Bruce, go back to the first, the first one, would you please? Um, and then a persistent problem. Um, we have experience with workplace issues. You might think that your specific issue is unique to you and the person that is causing you this uh, problem. But I'm telling you, it, working in human resources, and it's, it, there are issues that we deal with every day, there's very few times that you'll go to an HR professional where they won't have some experience with a situation similar to yours or exactly like yours. And they certainly can offer you help and advice. Now the next slide, please. Mr. Foistel. Thank you. So involve us sooner rather than later. You certainly don't want to wait till the conflict escalates and then run down to human resources and say, oh my gosh, this has gotten completely out of hand. Help me. Hopefully, if you come to us sooner, we're going to be able to help you diffuse the situation, offer you some advice on how to deal with it, and we're going to then document that there's a situation potentially happening. And what that does is put everyone on notice that an independent party knows about this, and so cooler heads better prevail. Accept responsibility for asking for help from HR. So when we confront the other person or try to mediate the situation, I don't think that it is a bad strategy to say, you know, this was really more than what I felt I could handle independently. Therefore, I sought human resource help because they deal with these types of issues every day. I think that it's a, a much better strategy to say that up front rather than acting surprised that human resources has gotten involved. And you might, involve, you might inform the other par party of that, that you are going to go to human resources for help because you feel like you need it. You don't have the experience necessary to deal with this type of interaction. Brief HR uh, prior to meeting Together, we'll talk with you, we'll talk to the other party, and try to be that mediator. Um, and then we'll meet as one body to resolve the concern. Really, that works the best, in my experience, if we get everybody in the room after talking with each person individually, and then we try to strategize how we're going to move forward. Careers last a long time. We need to maintain the relationships and figure out how both people move forward in a professional manner. You don't have to have sleepovers. You don't have to go to coffee every day, but you have to maintain a professional working relationship moving forward. That last one, Bruce. So here's what we'll do for you. HR will listen objectively to both parties' concerns and try to determine a successful path forward. We're going to try to answer your concerns, but also the concerns of the party that you've had the negative interaction with. We're going to propose solutions based on the experience with similar and past concerns and remedies, things that have worked before, things that have been successful in the same types of problems in the same, re in the same working relationship. And then we're going to follow up. So after we meet and after we make some of these recommendations, the thing that uh, human resource professionals are really good at is making sure that these relationships are maintained and that the workplace is safe and that people are moving forward. So we'll probably check back with you in a week and then a month until we find out that things that there has been a positive way forward. <coughs> Excuse me. We'll also document the concern. We, we keep a file on any 
workplace situation just to make sure that we have all of the details correct so that it preserves the, uh, the situation should it evolve into something more serious. And um, that's going to be documented from you in an, for you in an objective way. And the other thing is human resources serves as a safe haven for both parties. We don't have a, a side on the issue. We want to make that sure that both sides are heard, that we can propose remedies, and we can seek strategies for you to move forward. That's it, Bruce. Thank you. Well, now we turn, now we turn to your questions. And our uh, assistants here are alerting us to some of your uh, particular questions. And a question about Bullying by a manager uh, is a difficult situation to handle without going over your supervisor's head. Suggestions on how, uh, on how to handle uh, this before having to get to HR would be appreciated. So Lori, I'll take a, a first shot on this one and okay. then um, uh, I'll ask for your thoughts. Uh, but the bullying by the manager is a particularly difficult situation. Uh, it's a power situation where the person can extract penalties on you. Uh, and there is some uh, sense of, uh, of wanting to try uh, a number of things uh, beforehand. So using Lori's guidelines on when to involve HR, I would also go back to the earlier slide about having those difficult situations, uh, difficult conversations. I think you have a, a clear situation where you don't label the behavior, but you try and talk about uh, the situation and the problems that you're having uh, in them uh, is important. But this is also a situation where I think it's valuable to talk to a trusted colleague. If this manager uh, is managing you, perhaps this person is managing others. Uh, other people may have more success with this manager or have more insights. So I think it's first the question of getting some suggestions uh, about how these other people have dealt with the, uh, the situation. Come into the difficult uh, conversation with the manager with as much information and, and background as you can, some, uh, as much perspective as possible. Uh, but I think you first try to have that difficult conversation uh, with the manager to be explicit about what's causing the difficult situation. Again, without labeling, even though it may be bullying, uh, I don't think you use uh, labels that uh, try to, or that, that may be incendiary, but you try to be as professional as possible in having that conversation. But I think a key may be having the conversation with a trusted colleague or coworker who, who may have a better uh, working relationship with that manager than you do. Lori, some thoughts? Yeah, I would, I would just encourage folks that your human resource professionals are a trusted colleague. And re remember when I said your, how you're going to help us help you is if when you come to us, you're able to explain exactly why you're there to talk with us. So if you said to us, I have a situation that I feel I'm being bullied. I don't know if it rises to the level of a hostile workplace, but I just need someone to hear me out and give me some strategies on how to deal with this. I don't want you to take any action. I just want to brainstorm with somebody with some professional experience so that I can better deal with the situation. We're going to take that as a human resources professional as a in confidence. We're not going to take any action because you've asked us not to take action. But here's what we will do. We'll check back with you in a week after we talk through some potential scenarios and remedies, and we'll see if you were successful with those, or we'll see if you then want any additional help from human resources to help you manage the situation. Okay, and now we go to Jean with our next question. Thank you, Bruce. And I just want to remind everyone online that uh, if you have a question for us, please put it in the lower right hand uh, chat box there. Uh, we're probably going to, uh, just a fair warning, we'll probably go to about 10 minutes past the hour uh, so that we can get to some of these questions. So uh, please get them in as quickly as you can. Uh, our next question, Bruce and Lori, uh, comes from someone who says, what if you go to a person and that person that de denies that a problem exists? Are there suggestions on, on how to convince them that, that there is a problem? 
Well, I think this is where the active listening, clarifying questions, those sort of skills go forward. And I think you, Lori's uh, description of talking explicitly is important. I, I think in this situation where the person says a problem doesn't exist, then I think you go over a specific event, uh, a situation in, uh, in which there was uh, a, a work project or uh, some uh, event over uh, creating a bill draft or whatever it might be, doing a research project, to get explicit about the, uh, uh, the actual uh, behavior, uh, talk about uh, what happened from your own perspective, and then ask the person uh, from uh, what exactly happened from their perspective. I think it's a question of uh, using your skills to, to flesh things out, uh, to ask for, for more information and, and not allow it to be ended just by uh, a dismissive, oh, there's, there's no problem. Uh, I, I think that's when you have to use your good skills as a staffer to, to get to the next level, uh, to go over an explicit example uh, and, and give your side of it and then ask for, uh, for their uh, sense of perception. Lori? And, and Lori, this is Lori. Excuse me, this is Gene. And someone that the person asked the follow-up. They said the person knows there's a problem, but they're denying it as their strategy to minimize you. Uh, I'll just throw that in there as you prepare okay. your answer. Okay, thank you. So what I would say is exact. I would mirror what Bruce said and elaborate on that to say you need to. It, it and it takes courage, and I know it takes courage, but. You need to accept ownership of your feelings and say to that colleague, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. In our recent interaction, when you said this, this is what I heard, and this is how it made me feel. I don't respond to that. Next time, I wish you would state it like this, and I think that's going to be a more workable situation. Now, if you do that and you put yourself out there to say, this is how you make me feel and this is what I hear when you confront me in this manner, I mean, there is an element of vulnerability. But I think that you have to be honest with a person that's in denial and saying there's no problem that exists. And almost to the cavalier um, uh, response of, what are you talking about? I didn't hurt your feelings. Well, you need to be more specific with them and say, when you said this, I heard this, and this is how that made me feel that makes it difficult for me to continue to work with you because I feel this way. And sometimes when you do that, usually it diffuses the person that is over the top and bullying. They don't, I, I think oftentimes, they really don't recognize how they're coming across. And so when you make it evident to them, sometimes it gets better, sometimes it doesn't. And if it escalates, then you have to get professional help with human resources. Thank you very much, Lori. Uh, our next question, I'll probably uh, toss this to you off the top, uh, Lori, is that uh, this person is interested in suggestions on how, to, when you're doing legislative staff interviews, on questions to properly vet people to uh, kind of get away from the difficult uh, uh, potential coworker. Do you have interview suggestion tips? Sure. Tell us about a time when you caused a problem, how you solved it, what you learned, and how you moved forward. I would also suggest uh, talking about uh, the potential kinds of difficult people uh, that you'll have to work with in uh, your uh, staff uh, for the legislative uh, attorneys. Uh, it was the unreasonable uh, timeline request, uh, uh, the expecting too much to be done in, in too short a time or expecting that that legislator could be jumped ahead of, of all others who had requests in uh, and explain the situation and ask them to, if not role play uh, the response, to, to give the message back that you'd use to handle that situation. So uh, when I was interviewing uh, potential uh, legislative attorneys uh, in my legislative job, uh, it would be to take those kind of situations and ask people uh, to 
uh, describe how they would handle those particular situations. It's not 100% connected. Some people can say they'll uh, how they'll handle something, and it isn't uh, exactly the same as being in that situation. But the other aspect, just being in an inter interview is a stressful situation and a difficult situation, and you can get cues from people's ability to handle the interview uh, situation. Uh, it does give you some indicators uh, as to how they'll handle difficult people on the job. Another question we've used is tell us about tell us about a personality type that's the most difficult for you to deal with in the workplace and how you deal with it. And that usually is telling as well. Excellent advice. Thank you both. Uh, our next question, uh, our, uh, our questioner suggests that hostility sometimes might be due to insecurity or fear about one's job or, or their role in an organization. How should managers best address those types of fears. I'll start, Lori, and and you can kick in uh, behind it. I am big on being honest. Uh, it, being transparent as a as a manager, uh, putting a positive spin on things. Yes, but if you recognize that that's part of the dilemma uh, for your staff, uh, for those kinds of uh, uh, stresses that you feel that your uh, employees, your staff uh, may be under, I think you gather the group and, and have an honest uh, talk about the stresses that you're all under. So I think people need to, to have their spirits lifted to, to be able to see uh, the bigger picture when you're in the middle of, of some of the hardest points of the session. I, I, I remember times when it felt like you know, legislative work was just all-encompassing all the time and incredibly difficult. And I think that's where an managers earn their keep. It, it's giving people the perspective that you'll make your way through it, you continue to do your job to your best professional advantage, and at least you as the manager truly appreciate the work that they're doing. So I think that's the time uh, as a manager when you really uh, prove your mettle and, and uh, uh, inspire people to keep on doing the good work in tough times. I would, you know, the minute I heard that question, the first thing I thought of is a, a, a old, old book by Ken Blanchard called The One Minute Manager. And in The One Minute Manager, it's constantly praising employees. And, you know, stop and think about yourself. When in your professional life have you said, oh, just no more praising. I don't need any more praising. I know I'm good. And just Please, don't, don't give me any more praises. We all love to hear that we're doing a good job, and we want that reassurance from our bosses specifically. And I think that it, the, in the One Minute Manager it says, praise generously. Be extravagant with praise, but not, not a hollow praise. And you want to be very specific. So when you're talking to your employee that may feel that they need reassurance with their job, you want to say, I just want to tell you today, Joe, you did a great job on this project and here's why it was significant. This is why I thought it was so great. It's not enough just to say, great job, Joe. You've got to be specific and let them know what specific action that they have just performed that you're praising and why that was worthy of praise. That's going to build their confidence and make them feel valued as an employee. And I think that's the job of all of us as managers and as peripheral managers. You want to catch them doing something right, and you want to acknowledge it and praise them immediately. That's going to build their confidence for the more difficult parts of their jobs that we all have to deal with on a daily basis. All right. Thank you for that. And we're going to go to two more questions here before we end. Uh, one, we've got a, kind of a, a real-life situation here. Uh, the questioner says we have a new hire employee that is incompetent, doesn't take responsibility for anything, and blames everything on everyone else. We've tried to help this person, but uh, re the person refuses to listen to us. Uh, any advice in that particular situation? Well, one thing that comes to mind is that not everyone stays. Not everyone uh, continues on forever. Uh, some of the some of the time you make a decision that, that someone, uh, uh, despite all advice, despite all uh, 
uh, help from from others uh, is just not the right person for the job and that you uh, decide that this isn't a fit. Uh, so that's an option. I think you, you have to honestly, though, understand or, or make the assessment, have I really tried uh, everything possible to, to make this work? But, you know, Brian Weaver here at NCSL has, has talked about the necessity of, of managers not spending all their time with the problem children, that if someone has had the opportunity uh, to improve, has been given clear motivation and assistance in improving, and they choose not to follow that line, uh, then the answer may be uh, uh, making a, a termination uh, a decision. So I, I think the thing is, bend over backwards trying to help people, bend over backwards trying to, to make things work, uh, but don't uh, uh, bring down the ship uh, for one person. I would just add, start with the position description and sit down with the employee and say, here are the tasks that we hired you to do. Not everybody's all good, not everybody's all bad. So you want to sandwich the information that you're giving them. Here's the areas that I think that you're succeeding on. Here's the areas that you are not succeeding on. Let me give you some specific examples of how you did not meet the performance necessary in these specific items. And let me tell you what I'm going to need you to do, and let me tell you how long I will give you to do that. Because it can't, I can't go on forever. I, I will give you a reasonable period of time to improve your performance in these areas, but if that time comes, and you have not been able to improve in those areas, I'm not positive that we're going to be able to keep you working with us. And the thing I'd add to that, I think it's excellent advice, all of this is sort of ratcheted uh, responses that you, know, you first try to do things uh, in a, a more uh, easygoing setting, uh, uh, but when you realize that doesn't work, you have to be very explicit, as Laurie was saying, uh, on exactly what the uh, expectations are. So there's absolutely no uh, misunderstanding or no reasonable misunderstanding uh, of things. And that timetable by which things must improve, uh, again, gives true clarity. And Gene, you had one more question? Okay, well, our, our last question has to do with uh, uh, managers. Uh, one person says they deal with a micromanager uh, that uh, doesn't give them a time for independent work. And another one has a supervisor who never lets the person talk or uh, get their point across. The uh, supervisor cuts them off. Do you have advice for how to deal with managers like that? Well, I'll start, Lurie, and, and then add in on that. Um, I think both of these go to situations uh, where the employee is trying something and it doesn't seem uh, it doesn't seem to work. That uh, the, uh, the repeated conversations uh, uh, are not leading to independent work, uh, and the situation where you're uh, dealing with a supervisor uh, who won't let you get your point across. Uh, let me start with the, the getting your point across. Uh, if you're not getting, uh, you're getting constantly interrupted. Uh, I think you have to follow the, seek first to understand and let the person, uh, in a sense, get that person's point across and follow up with additional questions to say, I want to absolutely make sure I understand you before I make my point. Uh, so you get that sense that they have truly gotten out what they want to say, but then lead in with a very clear statement uh, that I need you to hear me all the way through on this. So setting the stage, being very, again, very explicit, very clear. Uh, it, it may still not work and you may then have to go up the, the, the ladder to, to HR. You may also uh, seek advice from a colleague, but there are people like this. And I think you may just have to give them extra time to get their point across uh, before you get yours, but you have to set the stage for them to listen. You have to be very explicit that I need you to listen to me uh, uh, because it isn't that person's natural inclination. 
For the micromanager, I think, again, you have to be uh, explicit and say, my sense from the way we've interacted is that I've tried to gain independence, and I think I've done the steps necessary to, to be granted more independence, but it hasn't come. So I want to have a conversation uh, about why that hasn't happened. Uh, again, the, the, the core between these two is the degree of explicitness that you have to come to uh, uh, before you may be successful. Yeah, I, I think you're right on, Bruce. And I, I would just add, um, for the micromanager, you know, a, a good question to ask a micromanager specific, I mean, especially if you've worked for them for a period of time is, do you trust me? Do you trust that I'm doing good work? Have I pleased you in the past with the work that I've done for you? And if the answer to those questions is yes, 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 then you're going to be able to follow up and say, then will you let me have some uh, leeway and flexibility in how I'm proceeding forward with the tasks that you've given me? If you can tell me what the tasks are and give me my due date, if I let you down, then absolutely, I want you to micromanage me so that I get them done. But if I don't let you down and I succeed in meeting your expectations, I'm going to be happier and you'll be happy as well. So that's going to make for a happier workplace. So I think that's that strategy. And a word in edgewise, you're just going to have to listen to your manager is completely talked out and then say, I really want some points to make and I have X, I have three, I have however many you have. That lets the manager know, oh, there's going to be three things that this person is going to say. And then say, my first point is, and jump in like that. And then uh, you might also say, you know, sometimes I feel intimidated because you're my boss to jump in and give you my perspective, but I really want to share my perspective with you, and I think that you would want to hear it. Am I right? And that might give them a signal to I'm over-talking them. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, Lori and Bruce, let me ask you for some final thoughts uh, before we leave. And Lori, I know we've kept you longer than we said we would, so I'll, I'll let you uh, start first. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I would just say we work in, I've never in my career ever worked in a more passionate uh, place where people really want to be working for the legislature. They love the work that they do. It's worthwhile work. But along with those passionate workplace environment come high emotions. And so we have a lot of this in our work environment. But there are tried and true proven strategies for working with that. And I would just encourage you by saying don't mirror the bad behavior. Think of the long-term picture. Your career is going to last a long time. You need to maintain professional relationships because they're going to come and go throughout your career. And the last thing is, ask yourself, um, is it critical that I win this confrontation or can I let this person win and maintain that relationship? And you're going to feel better about it and the people around you and working with you are going to be watching how you interact with these types of difficult people and you will end up winning those, those uh, potentially negative confrontations because of your actions, and that's really the only one you can control. And with that, I'm signing off. I've got another meeting. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you, Lori. We appreciate your time so much. Ruth, All righty. Some final Bye -bye. thoughts from you? Thank you. Well, I take us back to your own responses on the importance of uh, the calm demeanor and, and patience. That is what stood out for me and uh, uh, I, I think stood out for you in terms of your own responses, that ability to stay calm and to stay patient, uh, to almost make uh, life slow down in those worst moments uh, and, and act uh, professionally. Uh, I see from some of the comments that others have mentioned things like the importance of uh, acting in good faith uh, legitimately uh, trying to, 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 to solve problems and that those are all important. But I think sometimes it's that first moment uh, that's so hard. You almost feel swept away uh, uh, because it, this problem may have come out of left field. It may be with a person that you've previously worked for and had no problems or a person that you think you should have earned all the respect and understanding uh, in the world, and all of a sudden this person's turning on you. Uh, so I think the first moments are, are most important, and that's what I want to leave you with. Strive to 
turn a button on that keeps you in that calm, patient, problem-solving, professional uh, model uh, and do your best to make your way through that and realize you'll have time to reflect with others uh, to, to solve the longer-term aspects uh, uh, as time goes forward. So buy yourself some time. Uh, do the best job you can of staying professional. Use Arturo Perez's North Star focus on what's most important to me here, uh, what's import most important uh, to the, the work aspect of this, uh, and just do your best. You were hired in part for your ability to handle uh, these situations, and this is just another chance for you to grow. Thank you so much for that, Bruce. We really appreciate your your time and everyone's uh, attention uh, today. Um, uh, some of the questions we were not able to uh, get to today, uh, but uh, Bruce has promised to follow up with, uh, with uh, those people who did not get their questions answered, and we will uh, be in touch with you soon. Uh, so again, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, you see some resources there. There's uh, Bruce's email address in uh, case you need to get a hold of him. Uh, as a reminder, you can keep track of all NCSL webinars by going to www.ncsl.org forward slash NCSLU. Our next webinar in the NCSL University series will be on November 9th. We'll have a comprehensive review on what voters decided on Election Day this year. And while webinars are a great place uh, to meet and uh, uh, get some information, we can't, uh, just can't replace the benefits of face-to-face -face meetings. So be sure to sign up for NCSL's fall forum meeting, which will take place in Washington, D.C., December 5th through the 7th. The elections will bring changes that will be significant to state legislatures, and NCSL will be your best opportunity to find out what those changes and issues are before the legislative sessions begin in 2013. Our special thanks to our panelists. We hope you enjoyed this discussion and look forward to being with you at our next webinar or NCSL meeting. On behalf of NCSL, Legislative Staff Coordinating Committee, and the group. NCSL's this Young Professionals Rose. Group, this is Gene Rose.